summertime and the living is easy fish are jumping and the cotton is high oh your daddy's rich and your ma is good looking so hush little baby It ain't necessarily so, it ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. Those two songs came from the opera Porgy and Bess, music by George Gershwin. My mother adored Gershwin music, so I grow, grew up listening to it and learning to love it myself. Now, I found out that the opera Porgy and Bess never would have happened without Phenomint, the delicious chewing gum laxative. Now, this is not going to be a story about George Gershwin's digestive issues. It's a story about a man with goals. George Gershwin set, set himself his first goal when he was only 15 years old. He told his older brother, Ira, Ira, I want to write songs. That's great, George. And so I've quit high school. You've quit high school? Does mama know? Does mama know what? Oh, hi, mama. I've, I've quit high school and I've gotten a job. Who would hire a 15-year-old accountant? Mama, you're the only one who wants me to be an accountant. I want to write songs. All right, who would hire a 15-year-old to write songs? Well, nobody, Mama. But I do have a job at a music publisher's house. I'll be playing the piano, demonstrating songs to vaudeville stars as they come into New York City. Hmm. Well, how much are you going to get paid to do that? $10 a week, Mama. Well, despite Mama's sniff, $10 a week in 1913 for a 15-year-old was very respectable pay. And that's what George started to do. And go up to Harlem and listen to the bands play there. Three years later, he had another conversation with his older brother, Ira. He said, Ira, I've decided not only do I want to write popular songs, but I want to write serious music. That's great, George, but how are you going to do that? Are you going to go back to high school and then go to a conservatory? No, Ira, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll take private lessons in, in all kinds of things, rhythm and harmony, composition, orchestration, even conducting. I want to learn it all, Ira. That's great, George. And so George became a lifelong learner, even though that wasn't a, ter a term used during that time period. The next year, when he was only 19, he had his first big hit, the song Swanee. It, it doesn't sound like a Gershwin song, you know, the Al Jolson yeah. theme song. Oh. But it was a huge hit, made him a fabulous amount of money, and brought him to, really to the attention of people. And he started writing Broadway musicals then, not with his brother Ira, um, but uh, they, were, they were very close. Then when George was 25, he wrote his first serious piece of music. The brothers had another conversation. Ira said, I, 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 read, I see here in the paper, George, that Paul Whiteman is going to have a concert with many different musicians and many different compositions. And you're going to write one of them. Yes. Yes, I am, Ira. I'm going to write a jazz composition. 
You mean, what do you mean you're going to write it? You haven't written it yet? No, Ira, I haven't. But George, it says here in the paper that the concert's in six weeks. What? Paul Whiteman didn't tell me that. So George started furiously working on this new composition. A couple of weeks later, Ira sat in while George was playing some of it, and he said, what are you going to call this, George? George said, I'm thinking American Rhapsody or American Fantasy. Hmm. Well, you know, George, I just went to an art exhibit by the artist Whistler, and he names his compositions, you know, his paintings, with a combination of a uh, musical term and colors. Uh, can you give me an example, Ira? Well, sure. You know that painting, Whistler's Mother? Well, its actual name is Arrangement in Gray and White. And he also had a, composition, uh, a painting called Nocturne in Blue and Silver and Symphony in White. Oh, that's, that's very interesting, Ira. George, you know, you could call this piece Rhapsody in Blue. I like it, Ira. I'll use it. Well, it was the hit of this concert. It was a huge concert. It lasted over three hours. And people had been starting to drift away into the lobby when George started playing Rhapsody in Blue. George and Paul Whiteman's orchestra started playing Rhapsody in Blue. And the music drew the people in from the lobby. Afterwards, George said, I think I have demonstrated that jazz is more than just dance music. True music must reflect the thoughts and inspirations of the people and time. My people are Americans. My time is now. So after Rhapsody in Blue, George continued taking lessons. He continued writing serious music. He wrote six more serious compositions, including American in Paris. And he and Ira started writing musicals together, two to three a year. Ooh. Yes, quite, quite a, a regimen they were doing. <laughs> and then George was 34, and he set himself another goal, to write an opera. He had seen a play called Porgy and loved it and had contacted the author, Du Bois Hayward, and said, I'd like to make this into an opera. And Du Bois said, that would be wonderful. But George had a problem. By this time, he had quite a lavish lifestyle. He had a 14-room duplex on East 72nd Street. And he was living off the income he made from the two to three musicals he was writing a year. He knew he couldn't write an opera on the side while doing the musicals. He knew he had to take at least a year off. And while he was contemplating how to finance that year off, he was offered an opportunity by Fenament, the delicious chewing gum laxative. They wanted him to record two 15-minute radio programs a week for them. They would, of course, be the sponsors. They were going to pay him $2,000 a week. This was 1933, when not many people made $2,000 a year. So George agreed to do it. When his friends found out about it, they said, George, that's so demeaning. You're going to be working for a, a laxative company? And he said, not at all. They are paying me very good money to play my music into homes across the United States. And I'll be able to accomplish my goal, to write an opera. His secretary said, many composers say, I'm going to write an opera. But George did. So after working nine months for Fenement, he took time off. 
It started with a month where he and Du Bois Hayward went down to South Carolina, to the coastal area, to live among the Gullah people. The month, however, was July. Mm. July on the coast of South Carolina. I'm sweating now just thinking of it. The humidity and the heat. He went from his 14-room duplex to a four-room cabin. No electricity, no running water. Now, he did bring his cook and valet with him, so roughing it, well, for him it was. And he and Du Bois Hayward talked to people. They went to their church services. They just immersed themselves in that lifestyle. And then after a month, he came back to his 14-room duplex and spent 17 months writing the vocal score and then the orchestrations. On opening night on Broadway, Porgy and Bess got a 30-minute standing ovation. Yes, a 30-minute standing ovation. Afterwards, Mama said, I deserve a new mink coat. <laughs> George said, all right, Mama, you buy one and I'll pay for it. Mama got herself a sable. I think it was very nice that George and Ira had each other for support. I don't think Mama gave them a whole lot. So it was very good that George had seized that opportunity offered him by Fenement. Because two years later, after the Broadway opening of Porgy and Bess, George, George got really ill. It started with dizziness and then went to periods of blackout and then acting really erratic. It took the doctor six months to determine that he had a brain tumor. And by this time, it was the size of a grapefruit. They tried to operate, but, but this was in the 1930s. Brain surgery, no. He, he, he died a day or so after the operation. I can't tell you the number of times my mother said to me, just think of the music that George Gershwin would have written if he had lived longer. She was right. He had plans for two new musicals and a film collaboration with George Balanchine mm -hmm. from the New York City Ballet. And, and this is what kills me, he was planning to write a symphony. Oh, I, I would love to have heard a symphony written by the man who had written Porgy and Bess and American in Paris and Rhapsody in Blue. It would have been a symphony like we've never heard. Well, at age 34, even though George had thought he was in the summertime of his life, he still seized that opportunity offered to him by Fenement. Summertime, it ain't necessarily so. 